muted. I think we are ready to get started. Um, just a heads up to everyone, this webinar will be recorded. Um, so I'll just wait until that's going. Our All right. recording, Julie. Right. Great, thanks. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I would see a visual view or not. Good afternoon and welcome to Strategies to Achieve Deep Energy Savings in Multifamily Housing. As I mentioned, I'm Julia Friedman with the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Um, and on behalf of the other regional energy efficiency organizations who are hosting this webinar and produce the report that we'll be going over, we'd like to welcome you and thank you for your participation. Uh, so today we'll be providing an overview of the contents of a new report that was authored by the Regional Energy Efficiency Organizations called Multifamily Energy Efficiency Retrofits, Barriers and Opportunities for Deep Energy Savings. Um, following that presentation, you'll hear from two of the folks who were involved in uh, two of the case studies that are featured in the report. So just uh, some quick housekeeping items before we get started. Um, right now you are in listen-only mode. Um, so in order to ask questions, you'll remain uh, on mute for the whole webinar. In order to ask questions, please feel free to type them into the questions pane, and then they will be read aloud during a facilitated Q&A. Um, also, if you are currently um, using your speaker, your computer speaker system to listen in and you'd rather use the telephone, just click the uh, telephone in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. And lastly, you'll notice that there's a pane called Handouts that has a link for a PDF of the actual report. Feel free to go ahead and click that link um, and you'll be able to download and access the report. So I mentioned that this webinar is hosted by the Regional Energy Efficiency Organizations. For those on the line who are not familiar with us, um, that's a designation given to uh, six organizations around the country by the U.S. Department of Energy that are all working in our own ways as well as collaboratively to advance energy efficiency. Uh, so um, I will go through and name the primary authors from each organization. Uh, just so you can get an idea of who was involved in this report. So from the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, Charlie Taylor, the High Performance Buildings Research and Analysis Associate. From the Southeast Energy Efficiency Alliance, Ashley Fournier, Director of Operations. From the South Central Partnership for Energy Efficiency as a research, Resource, Eric Fowler. He's their High Performance Building Programs Manager. And from the Southwest Energy Efficiency Project, Christine Brinker, who's a senior associate there. Um, clearly, there's a fix to the Northeast, uh, sorry, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance um, is a partner that we work with regularly, although they did not participate in the development of this report. All right, so this is what the actual report looks like. Um, we have a link available to you and um, all the RIOs will be getting it up on their own respective websites um, if you don't catch it on this webinar. So um, we will, so the report sort of uh, was organized in three sections. We had um, a section devoted to uh, a multifamily market characterization around the country and then a section devoted to sort of a survey of existing barriers and ways to address those barriers, given the experiences that each of us has had in our region and working with our various partners in our regions. And then we've got case studies um, of the programs and policies that have been particularly effective in addressing some of the challenges. Um, and so clearly there's a big focus on some of the barriers. Uh, what we've noticed is there's been a lot of momentum recently in addressing energy efficiency in the multifamily sector, but there are very specific challenges to working in this building sector. Um, so for instance, with split incentives, it's a question um, you know, between the tenant and the owner of who's making the investment in the energy efficiency improvement, and then who reaps 
the monetary savings that are generated by those investments. Uh, there are issues of a lack of capital or access to financing options. Multifamily buildings have complex financial structures that may make it difficult to take on new debt. Um, and there's a diversity in the building stock across different markets. Um, so making a one-size-fits-all, easily rolled out approach somewhat more difficult than in other types of building sectors. Um, insufficient uh, or inadequate data on energy consumption is something that you will hear about addressed in one of the case studies that we'll be presenting today. Um, but there are many sort of barriers that are unique to the multifamily sector that uh, we try to address in this paper. So with this paper, we asked three questions. What is the current state of the multifamily sector in the US? What has been effective for utility and state and local multifamily energy efficiency programs? And what else can be done to support energy efficiency in the multifamily buildings beyond traditional utility and municipal programs? Uh, so to start answering that first question, I mentioned we did a national market characterization. So let us jump into that. Uh, so multifamily buildings, I should also say, we are defining as buildings with five or more residential units. Um, and within this definition, 18% of housing units in the US are multifamily. Um, that represents a total of about 24 million units across the country. Um, so making multifamily buildings the second most prevalent type of housing in the US. Single family homes, uh, that's one unit attached or detached represents 89.5 million units. Mobile homes represent 8.5 million units. And buildings with two to four units represent 10.9 million units across the country. So taking a little bit of a closer look into the breakdown of the multifamily uh, building sector, structures with five to nine units account for 27% of this building stock. Structures with 10 to 19 units account for 25% of the building stock. And then structures with more than 20 units account for 48% of the multifamily building stock. We also looked at kind of where the multifamily buildings are across the country. Um, and I don't think any of us were really surprised when we found that most of them are in uh, metropolitan areas. So, a total of 96% of multifamily units are found in metropolitan areas. And according to the US Census Bureau, urbanized metropolitan areas are those with at least 50,000 or more people. Um, reasons for the higher occurrence of multifamily buildings in urban areas include zoning ordinances, cost of land, population density, and larger historical patterns of development. We also took a look at sort of the demographics um, of the, those occupying the multifamily buildings and found that 88% of multifamily unit tenants are renters as opposed to owners. 19% of multifamily tenants' household income is below the poverty line. And 5% is the median energy burden for low-income multifamily households. And for those unfamiliar with the term energy burden, that's defined as the percent of household income spent on energy expenditure. And so we can compare that 5% um, of low-income multifamily households to non-low-income multifamily households whose energy burden is much lower at 1.5% or average across all households um, is 3.5%. And then lastly, we wanted to include sort of a more uplifting outlook for the multifamily sector, um, is that there is great potential for savings in this sector. Um, you know, right now the building stock has, multifamily rentals in particular, have 34% fewer efficiency features compared to other types of housing. Um, and there's just huge build savings in the billions. Um, for deep energy retrofits that can achieve between 15 and 30% ed energy savings. So lots of potential, lots of work to be done. Um, and how we go about that is something that Charlie Taylor is going to talk to you about. All right. 
Thanks a lot, Julia. This is Charlie Taylor with uh, Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnerships. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about the second section of the paper, which um, identified um, opportunities to overcome some of the barriers that uh, Julia described earlier. Um, and I should mention that we aren't going to be discussing all of the opportunities we identified today on this webinar just due to time constraints, but we chose to focus on the ones that are going to be most relevant when you hear from um, some of the, the case study presenters later on in the webinar. Um, so I would advise you to, to download the report um, if you want more information, um, more, more detail on, on some of these opportunities. Uh, but I'm going to start with some of the energy efficiency program opportunities that, that we see um, nationally. Um, and the first opportunity we see is for really just more simplicity in the multifamily um, retrofit programs out there. And, and when I say simplicity, um, really what I mean is simplicity for the building owner um, and reducing their, their kind of burden for bringing their uh, building through a, a retrofit project. Um, and one way we see to do that is by targeting programs specifically for the multifamily sector rather than lumping them into residential or commercial programs that might not always be well suited for the multifamily market. Um, really targeting the multifamily sector in a um, specific program. Um, and we really would, um, what we see is some of those successful programs will really dive in and do a, um, a multifamily market characterization. So similar to what we have provided in this report, uh, but, but also kind of dive in a little deeper at the local level um, and target it to the local market. So you look at some areas have, you know, higher proportions of condos and co-ops and other ownership structures um, and tailoring your programs to, um, to the market. Um, another opportunity um, there is, is by kind of bundling direct install programs um, with more comprehensive programs. And we see that um, some programs are, you know, providing that initial in to the, to the home and introduction to the home uh, building owner um, by providing, you know, quick, easy, direct install measures. Um, and we find that when, when those are bundled with, as part of a more comprehensive audit, um, it's easier to kind of show the overall project saving, savings of a deeper, of a deeper retrofit. So things like um, envelope, retro, uh, envelope improvements and HVAC replacement. Um, when you have those, the savings of a direct install uh, measures um, and kind of build that trust through providing direct install, um, that's a, been a really successful strategy. Um, and al also kind of bundling all this into a one-stop shop program design um, really uh, streamlines the process for the building owner, um, gives them one um, point of contact throughout the whole process. Um, and really usually provides a, a much better, um, more customer-friendly uh, experience. Um, we also saw the opportunity for, for more coordination um, and targeting low-income multifamily buildings. Um, you know, these are obviously renters with the highest energy burden compared to other um, residential building types. Um, they can benefit most from the energy savings, the health um, improvements and the comfort improvements of energy efficiency. Um, and a few ways we've, we've seen to do that is by um, partnering with um, established community um, agencies. So things like, you know, community action organizations, um, you know, housing finance organizations, existing uh, organizations that already have relationships with tenants and building owners, um, and kind of leveraging that trust um, as a means to, you know, educate um, about the benefits of energy efficiency. Um, and also, you know, building networks of really knowledgeable contractors and associations. So, um, you know, that's coordination among the contractors working to um, implement the programs um, so that, you know, messaging and the education is really consistent about all the different program offerings but also networks of the contractors actually implementing the, the work. So um, ensuring that you have contractors who are, you know, well-trained um, and qualified to do high-quality um, energy efficiency work. Um, so the second 
part of the uh, opportunity section, we, we highlighted some of the policy opportunities, as well as some opportunities for other, other stakeholders um, working in the, in the multifamily sector. But one of the big ones that we're going to hear a bit more about um, later in the webinar is um, supporting building energy um, benchmarking and transparency policies. Um, and so these policies require building owners to, to benchmark, which you know, they allows them to track their energy usage over time compared to similar buildings, prioritize energy efficiency investments, and then there's the disclosure piece, which also brings energy efficiency information to the real estate market. Um, so there's the two kind of aspects of those policies. Um, we also highlighted some additional efforts to bring other building energy data to the real estate market. So things like building energy asset ratings um, to, you know, a rating of the physical structure rather than the operational um, patterns of, of the building. Um, and we looked to other states and uh, where, you know, policies have been passed to incorporate asset ratings into efficiency programs, um, other partnerships such as the Department of Energy partnership with CoStar to get energy performance data into the, their online property database. Um, that's a really, really big opportunity. Um, and so the technical assistance piece is one where we've really seen a lot of um, complementary features to having a voluntary energy challenge to go alongside these energy benchmarking and transparency policies. So um, you know, supporting efforts to establish a, a challenge for building owners uh, where they commit to reducing their energy consumption and then providing the um, technical support and the tools to do so and the ability to learn from other building owners. Um, so that was one of the areas where we really saw the Rios as potentially having a role um, in kind of um, facilitating regional or, or national or statewide um, energy challenges. Um, for multifamily buildings. Um, and the last piece we, that I'll highlight here is um, efforts to streamline access to energy analysis and planning tools. So things such, such as uh, EPA's portfolio manager, um, you know, WeGoWise, uh, energy scorecards. Um, policymakers can, you know, not only support the development of these software tools, like in the case of portfolio manager, um, but also through, um, you know, some instances of supporting, you know, subsidized um, accounts for for pilot programs for building owners to to use the the paid programs if they provide additional functionality that's um, that's useful. Um, and I would encourage you to, you know, go through our report for additional opportunities that we see. Um, in the market, uh, but this is just a selection that I think are going to be relevant for the, the following speakers. Um, and right now, I'm going to I'm going to introduce our next speaker, um, or speakers, I should say. We have James Collin, uh, Collins and Elizabeth Crouchheid from the Low Income Multifamily Energy Retrofit Program um, at Action for Boston Community Development, or ABCD, um, and they are. Uh, managing a, a low-income multifamily retrofit program um, in Massachusetts. Um, and I'm going to take you guys off mute. Hi. Uh, Charlie, thank you. This is uh, James Collins. Thanks for having us today. Um, I am going to talk about uh, the, the low-income multifamily program in Massachusetts. Um, and I've been with ABCD uh, and working um, in the program since 2011. Um, and the program started in 2009 as part of the uh, Green Communities Act um, in Massachusetts, which provides funding for all sectors for energy efficiency work. Um, and we manage the low income sector. Um, and uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, are really three key factors um, to how our program has been uh, successful over the, the last uh, seven years and really what that means um, 
in terms of how we roll out the program and and all the pieces that uh, are put together to to get clients the efficiency that they that they need. So one of the big uh, pieces of the program that, uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, some of the barriers to uh, multifamily efficiency in the low-income sector uh, is that we provide full implementation and 100% incentive for cost-effective measures. Um, a second key aspect is that we provide a whole building evaluation uh, regardless of, of fuel type, as well as uh, the third piece, which really is an important uh, piece to roll out the program, which is strong community partnerships. And really, the, the goal um, of our complete implementation is to make it as easy for clients uh, as possible. So we actually operate um, from start to finish uh, the application portal, qualification, um, and then all the way to scoping, uh, contractor procurement, bidding, um, and inspections and oversight for uh, for the work that's installed in the field. And we also uh, pay the contractors directly. We are able to also work with projects that are in process, refinance projects, and uh, other capital projects that are happening outside of our direct um, direct installation. However, uh, that is done um, through our office with coordinating with the, the people on site. Um, another piece of the 100% incentive that um, is important is that we look at the whole building and provide for all cost-effective measures 100% incentive. What was realized early on in the MassSafe program is that uh, the owners of affordable housing did not have the, the capital or access to capital to uh, finance these uh, energy efficiency projects. And, and as such, they weren't um, receiving the benefit of the, the program that was in place. And so uh, the utilities, the program administrators in the state, uh, as well as other stakeholders came together and determined that this program should be 100% incentive. And that, um, aside from the cost effectiveness uh, analysis, there's no limit to what a project, um, what how much can be invested in an energy efficiency project as long as it, it meets the cost effectiveness criteria. Uh, this is supported across the board um, from all stakeholders. And really what it does um, is it, it allows all clients to have really energy efficiency experts um, providing these services, and in particular for smaller um, smaller owners of affordable housing who may not have any staff that can really handle projects of this scope. Um, it really provides them the technical assistance and uh, expertise to to get as much out of energy efficiency of the energy efficiency program as they can. The Second uh, piece of real that is really important to how we roll out the program is that we approach uh, the, the properties with the whole building approach. And so, generally, uh, we take even though it's through the same program, we take a um, a parallel approach to electric work and gas work. Um, those are the primary uh, fuels that we that we deal with, and we provide two types of audits. Um, generally, it's coordinated, but there are some uh, inequity in, in the budget sizes. So, for instance, in the electric side, we have a, a much greater budget, and we're able to uh, address more buildings uh, within a given program year. However, we do coordinate with the site to try to get as much uh, completed on both, um, both fuel types whenever possible. And we are able to do this with, through, as I mentioned earlier, the cost effectiveness screening. We take uh, utility usage, and, and WeGo Wise was mentioned earlier. We we actually provide a first year of WeGo Wise of the WeGo Wise service um, for free for our clients that apply, uh, where they're able to monitor their own energy usage. But we were actually able to use that and provide analysis um, to determine real. Uh, forecasted savings, uh, modeled savings for for the client. We use that to uh, as determining criteria for moving forward with the energy savings measures that we have identified. Um, and it is a combination of 
direct install um, at that initial audit, particularly on the electric side um, with uh, light bulb swap outs um, and measures like that. But we, every project that we look at is custom. So we take into account all available uh, energy efficiency measures um, and try to work in the best package for the, for the client so that they're realizing as much savings uh, as they can. And it's a, it's a rolling application, uh, but when clients apply, they apply once, um, and we try to work with them on timing, as I mentioned before, uh, whether we go in and install the work um, with our procured contractors, or they have work that's going on. We really try to work alongside them to make sure that it's happening on a time frame that works for them. And finally, um, I want to talk about the partnerships that we have. Now, ABCD is a community action agency located in Boston, um, and we have many others located throughout the state. And the multifamily program was really designed to utilize that network of um, service providers throughout the uh, utility territories. Uh, we already provide weatherization assistance program services and HeartWAP services, and so we've been able to leverage um, all of that expertise uh, in the building science field as well as the engagement in the community to uh, identify the clients that we serve, the, the low-income multifamily buildings, and we actually have an advisory committee that's comprised of, um, of our community action agency efficiency folks as well as people who work at the uh, state housing agency, the Massachusetts finance agencies, um, the utilities are in the room, and, and other housing groups uh, and affordable housing owners to really leverage uh, their contacts and networks to ensure that we're reaching all the clients that we can. Um, and that's really a key aspect of, to really meeting the, the high goals that we have in Massachusetts um, year after year. And, and we've been lucky to, to use those relationships and, and really achieve um, something great with high uh, energy savings goals and, and putting these uh, efficiency projects into the, the affordable housing stock in Massachusetts. And as we look at the program and, and really how, uh, how far we've come, um, this year we have actually opened up serving oil heated buildings. Uh, when the program started, this was not uh, an aspect of the program and it was desired for some time. Uh, we're finding, in fact, that the, the stock is a little bit uh, less than we had anticipated uh, for oil heated multifamily buildings, but that is part of the program now. Uh, as we've really come to a point of seeing market saturation um, and, and the lighting market transformation in Massachusetts with LEDs, we're really looking for other technologies to move forward on, and air source heat pumps are one of the big uh, technologies that people are looking at hard right now. Um, additionally, as I mentioned, market saturation, really trying to look at the, uh, the groups of clients that may not fall under um, an association or ha haven't heard of the program and potentially serving higher um, income bracket of clients, more traditional um, definition of affordable housing, uh, which would likely be 80% or below of, of state median income. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we formalized this year, I had been doing it before, but formalized the process for um, integrating refinancing with, with our um, with our program and offering the, the proper time frame that works for ownership uh, and and even with the finance agencies to uh, to pay for these efficiency projects alongside other capital improvement uh, projects that may be happening at refinancing. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Great, thanks a lot, James. Um, so for those of you with questions, we'd encourage you to type them into the questions box, and we're going to do a Q&A session um, after the next presenter. Um, we'll try to do them all at the end, but 
Um, definitely type any questions you have into the, that questions box and we'll, we'll try to get to them. Um, so for our next presenter, we have um, Katie Kaluzny, the Associate Director at the USGBC, US Green Building Council, um, Illinois chapter. And uh, over the past nine years at USGBC Illinois, Katie has led the organization's education programs, volunteer engagement, and grant funding programming, including implementation of the Chicago Energy Benchmarking Ordinance. Prior to her time at USGBC, Katie played similar roles at the City of Chicago Department of Environment Center for Green Technology and the Chicago Academy of Sciences. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to you, Katie, and take it away when you're ready. Okay, thank you, Charlie. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, great. Um, thanks for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here today. Um, um, as Charlie mentioned, I'm Katie Klusny with uh, USGBC Illinois. Um, we were lucky to be a, a partner, part of a partner group implementing the Chicago Energy Benchmarking Ordinance, which passed in Chicago in 2013. Um, we wanted to make sure that the or implementation of this ordinance was very successful and smooth um, and really felt inclusive to everyone involved. And so we formed a kind of an informal partnership with other nonprofits that had similar missions um, related to the goals of this ordinance, including um, the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance, um, uh, AIA Chicago, ASHRAE Illinois, um, the Natural Resources Defense Council, um, the Mayor's Office, um, and several others. And so um, it was a really great collaborative group um, that worked together on making sure that the buildings that were implemented, um, that were affected by this ordinance, really felt like they had the support they needed um, to move forward. So I'm going to share, um, oh, there I am again. Sorry about that. <laughs> I'm going to share a little bit about the ordinance um, and some things that we've learned by working with multifamily properties through that process. Um, and for those that may not be familiar with the ordinance, I just wanted to share a couple of slides about the implementation timeline of that ordinance and which building types that impacted. I think that was really key to some of the success that we had um, in the implementation of the policy. Um, there was a voluntary program called Retrofit Chicago or the the Better Buildings Challenge for Chicago that had been going on for a while um, with some support um, with multifamily and commercial. Um, but this ordinance really um, certainly brought a lot more people into the fold to have to do that, um, but also brought more people into that voluntary program to show their interest in reduction. Um, this ordinance in Chicago only requires um, um, benchmarking and transparency. Um, no um, efficiency measures are required. Um, however, it also requires data verification in the first year and every third year after to ensure the data quality um, is, um, is correct um, and that, to make sure that that's something that you're benchmarking against yourself and you have solid baselines to work from. Um, you can see in um, 2014, June 1st, 2014, um, commercial, the largest commercial institutional buildings had to report their data for the first time um, and have it verified. Um, the second year was um, smaller commercial buildings, about 50,000 square feet and larger. And then we also started multifamily buildings, the largest, over 250,000 square feet. And then this year in 2016 um, was the first year we brought in um, multifamily buildings um, between 50,000 square feet and 25, um, 250,000 square feet. Um, so you can see um, the number of properties um, was drastic um, from year to year, um, starting with only 277 that were required to report in 2014 really making sure we had our systems in place, our support structures in place, um, making sure people understood the ordinance and we had time for outreach. And then in 2015, bringing in those smaller commercial and being able to focus our strategy on outreach to that group. Um, and then the largest multifamily, which a lot of them were from similar portfolios of buildings. And then in 2016, um, having two years of experience under our, our belt to um, make sure we could do that outreach to the smaller um, multifamily residential, which is a harder group to reach. Um, and you can see that percentage of citywide reporting um, this um, over the years has been pretty consistent. Um, the largest buildings, commercial buildings, um, all reported pretty easily in the first year. Um, and the second year, bringing in the smaller commercial drops that percentage of compliance down a little bit because, those again, those are buildings were harder to reach, but we're working on it. And then this year, we're actually really excited that the number stayed so high after bringing in all of the multifamily um, buildings in the 50,000 square foot range. Um, so that's just a little overview of how it's progressed over the past couple of years. 
Um, and then I just broke it down a little further. And by me, I don't mean I. Someone wrote this great report, and I've taken screenshots from it to share with you. Um, to show a little bit more about the percentage of reporting rate by the type of property, um, and then um, the square footage. So you can see um, a little bit down the chart the residential properties over 250,000 square feet in 2015, and then in 2016 their reporting rate. So you can see again the largest multifamily properties were pretty easier to communicate with, and a lot of them were members of associations like ABOMA or others that we could work with um, and communicate with. And then the smaller commercial or smaller residential properties have been a little harder to communicate with um, to get that right outreach, but that's something we're going to continue to work on in, in future years. Um, so I wanted to put up just a few um, key findings. These are overarching um, before I jump into kind of multifamily specifically. Um, over 2,700 properties are now tracking and reporting their energy use annually, um, and that it is estimated to have about a $17.8 million from the energy bills um, from those buildings that benchmark for the past two or three consecutive years. So it's really exciting to see um, that change, even though we don't quite know what they're doing um, yet in their properties. They're looking at their energy data that they may not have been looking at before, and that we're seeing an improvement um, in performance, um, which is great. That's what everyone wants to see. Um, and um, one thing also to point out is that that group of buildings that's reporting that we showed in the chart um, accounts for about 23% of the citywide energy consumption by buildings. Um, and we had 103 properties that volunteered to report their data um, that weren't required, so it's good for them too. Um, and then the reach, um, and as I mentioned, there's that phase in over several years. Um, it was actually a seven-fold increase from 2014, the number of buildings that had to report this year. Um, you can see some people really excited about benchmarking over there on the side um, that hadn't benchmarked before. Um, this is about 3,500 total properties that are included in the, in the, in the data between multifamily and commercial properties. And um, we're, work, we're working towards that. Um, the compliance was really high, um, but we still need to get to some buildings that we haven't reached yet. I'm going to tell you more about those people in the picture um, in a couple of slides. Um, so some of the impact, um, I mentioned the savings over time. That actually is a, about a 4% savings for those that have had consecutive years um, of reporting. And that group of buildings also improved their Energy Star scores by 6.6%. Um, again, properties with two years of consecutive reporting saw an, a collective energy reduction of 1.9%. Um, and a savings of $6.2 million per year. Um, and that group had a 7.8% reduction. So it's, it's looking really good. Um, but what we're really, really focused on and why we got involved in this um, ordinance um, was to get past those results. And we've been focused for the last three years on compliance to make sure that the ordinance goes really well. Um, but the outcomes that we really want to see, and I think all of the partners um, in Chicago really wanted to get to, is this performance and opportunity. And so by um, people looking at this energy use for the first time being required to do it. Um, some people were begrudgingly doing it at the start, um, but it's really opened their eyes to how their building's actually performing um, and is able to show a lot of opportunity um, to address energy waste um, and give an opportunity for all of the partners that work on energy efficiency in Chicago to jump in and help with, that oppor with those opportunities to show utility programs, other programs that these buildings aren't taking advantage of now that are there for them. Um, I'll, I won't read all the steps in the slide. You can see that. Um, so one thing that we've put together is a, um, a database of companies and organizations in the Chicago area that do this kind of work. So if you want to do this kind of work, where do you go? Um, a lot of people haven't looked before, and they don't know who can help them with benchmarking to begin with who can do that data verification requirement, but then also what if they want to do energy efficiency work? And who is that list of um, organizations that are here, and what are their qualifications? So we put together a survey um, which cr created a database of companies in the area um, based on what their skills and expertise are, what um, professional credentials they have on staff. Um, and then we can direct people to that when they want to do something. Instead of favoring one company over another, um, it's great to have this here for people to vet on their own. And we're hoping to do a 
kind of speed dating event with all these companies in the in the spring, um, so they can all talk to buildings about what they have to offer. Um, so through that process, we were able to work with a lot of multifamily properties. Um, through our volunteer group, we had a pro bono um, data verification um, group of 50 volunteers from different companies that signed up to say they would help affordable housing, nonprofits, um, multifamily profit properties that just haven't done this before, um, and, and churches, other folks that just needed help getting started. Um, and so we were able to meet a lot of folks through the process. Um, one is this um, adorable Renita Stubbs um, at Catholic Charities. Um, she ended up having, getting a case study in the Chicago Energy Benchmarking Report this year, um, which I'm not sure if this is, I'm supposed to be sharing this yet because it comes out pretty soon. Um, but here's a preview. Um, we worked with Catholic Charities. They contacted us and said, "There's, um, we got this letter in the mail. We don't know what to do. We've never looked at energy use um, at our property. Can you help us? And so we got a group of five volunteers together, went over to Catholic Charities and met with Renita and some of her office staff. Um, their office managers, facility managers, and they were so excited to learn portfolio manager um, and look at their energy bills, um, put them into something that they could talk to their boss about and make decisions. We helped them with 11 properties, um, and then she came back to one of the volunteers and asked if she could benchmark 15 more for properties that didn't even have to comply with the ordinance. Um, and so she is a very special person, but also, you know, it's really exciting to see what a policy can do to a portfolio of buildings um, that, you know, the square footage requirement is over 50,000 square feet. But Catholic Charities has a portfolio of, you know, many, many more properties than that that they can implement the same um, strategies with. Um, and the same goes for the Chicago Housing Authority. Um, the Chicago Housing Authority um, has a lot of buildings in Chicago. Um, but in particular, they had 39 senior housing facilities that were over that square footage range for sure um, that they needed to start looking at. Um, and so we worked with the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance on a um, benchmarking data jam um, where we also played the 90s Jock Jam soundtrack um, while we did it to make sure that it was extra fun um, looking at energy data. Um, and we met with the asset managers from their senior housing portfolio and then about 20 volunteers that work in different energy services around Chicago. Um, and so they were matched at their tables with each group, looking at um, understanding how the, the energy was being used in their buildings. And again, this may not be something that these asset managers are required to do on a daily basis, where they'd be benchmarking their buildings, but they could under, understand and see that this has an impact and how they manage their property has an impact on their energy efficiency. And so it was really great to have everyone in the room for that, instead of just one person that works for the Housing Authority, maybe just doing it themselves and not being able to disseminate that data um, in the same way. Um, and so they ended up um, submitting a full year before they were required to um, and saw some really great results, including many buildings near Energy Star certification eligibility and many others that were nowhere near that and needed some help. They just so happened to be in the stage of putting out new property management contracts um, that year, and so they were able to write in um, performance-based monetary incentives and disincentives based on energy performance and um, sustainable operations um, into their new contracts. And so they're, they've had those of about one year, and they're starting to work with all of those new contracts on those outcomes. Um, and so they're really excited. They have a five-year capital plan, um, but it's really exciting to see someone take um, a policy requirement that they were kind of annoyed about having to do um, to be some, take it to something that was really useful for them and also a lot of their um, HUD reporting requirements and then taking it to the next level into their management contracts um, and capital plans. Um, and all because of a great policy. Um, and I think sometimes people just need that push um, to start on down a path or down a process and that's what we've seen with a lot of multifamily properties. Some initial um, um, adverse reaction to a policy like this being introduced, um, but once understanding the process um, and seeing how easy it is to do and what and what power it gives you in decision making, um, it's really been a great result and we're excited to keep working on this, what I call beyond benchmarking work, um, now that the policy has been implemented over those three years. So um, that is my contact information if you have more questions, um, but I think I'll turn it back over to Charlie um, to 
take us to the next step. Great. Thanks a lot, Katie, uh, for the great presentation. Um, I'm actually going to turn it over to Eric Fowler from SPEAR, who's going to facilitate the Q&A session. Um, Eric, are you, are you ready? Can you hear me okay? Great. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, hi, this is Eric Fowler with SPEAR in Austin, the, the South Central Regional Energy Efficiency Organization. Um, just a reminder again, if anybody has any questions, uh, please type them into your question box. But the first question is for uh, James and the Massachusetts program. Uh, we had two questions. Uh, one is, how is the program different from the weatherization assistance program? And secondly, how is the program funded? Two questions on that. Sure. Um, so the program, in terms of the difference between it and the weatherization assistance program, is uh, it's a little more centralized. Um, not every community action agency in the state implements, as they do in the weatherization assistance program, uh, not all implement the multifamily program. So there are only uh, five of the community action agencies that actually uh, implement the work. The others provide um, kind of community support in terms of outreach, um, but it is overseen by those five uh, agencies. And in terms of the funding, um, it is 100% funded through the uh, program administrators, which are the utilities, uh, investor-owned utilities in Massachusetts. Um, and we get all the funding from them. No, no other uh, contributions are made from any other sources. And Furthermore, on the on the structure, uh, we have what what we call lead vendor structure for the utilities, um, and so it's those agencies, those five agencies that are the lead vendors for each individual uh, utility in Massachusetts that, that has the program. Great. I think one of the <clears throat> one of the follow up questions on that that came in is, do you have to calibrate the program? so that it works in coordination with owner refinancing, for instance? Are there any adjustments that have to be made on the program side for that? And uh, yeah, so. OK. Um, so in terms of the refinance, we, we make adjustments. Um, we have uh, yearly budgets. Uh, they're determined in three-year cycles. And so uh, our obligation is not only on behalf of the low-income clients that we serve, but of course, uh, our obligation is to meet the goals for the utilities, uh, both savings and uh, expenditures. So we do have to do make some adjustments throughout the year when projects uh, come in, depending on the timing. Um, we do try to plan as far ahead in advance um, if we know a project or an owner knows a project's coming up for refinance within uh, a given year or even two or three years down the road. Um, we try to identify that as early as possible. There have been instances where a project has gone through the refinance process, uh, unknowingly um, come to us at the end, you know, looking for for an incentive, and we work with that, um, and we're able to adjust uh, really the project pipeline um, with the with the limited number of projects that come through uh, in that way. Right. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much. Uh, looks like we just had a, <clears throat> a question here for uh, Katie. Um, on the energy benchmarking and transparency ordinances, I know that you know uh, several communities around the country are actively considering their own ordinances. Um, we're curious if you could talk a little bit about how, I mean, you know, wh what sort of headwinds did you face in the ordinance? Did, did, it, did it tend to get off the ground pretty quickly, or was there a lot of political resistance? Did you want the program to be bigger than it was, and you had to scale it back, or just sort of curious the evolution of the of the uh, of the benchmarking and transparency ordinance, and if you you know had obstacles along the way in getting it going, or if it's if it's you know just sailed right through. Sure, um, I think that you know what was a little easier for Chicago was that I think eight other cities had already recently passed. Um, energy benchmarking ordinances in their cities. So Chicago was the ninth um, major city to put an ordinance, ordinance through. And so there was precedent and also lessons to be learned from those other cities. Um, so we were the first city to add data verification um, to the ordinance. 
um, which actually I think helped it move through um, because other cities had heard had were having some data quality issues um, and data quality assurance, and then you know building owners seeing that their data would be out there and transparent um, and not checked um, by anyone. I think was a um, something that people were concerned about. So. Um, the transparency piece was a concern in Chicago as well, but I do believe that the data verification um, addition to that ordinance really helped um, move that through to know that the data that would be posted was um, um, validated by someone. Um, so there, the transparency was the, the more difficult piece. Um, there was talk about adding other things to the ordinance like some others have. Um, in New York, there's a requirement for lighting upgrades and um, energy audits. Um, some other cities have water um, required as well, and I think at the time the political climate was just to, that this is what we needed to focus on and this is what Chicago could do and that we could work on those other things through programs and good support and outreach um, to get to those next steps and, and look at what might work as a, um, something down the road. So the big other pushback was from, like I mentioned, most multifamily um, and just um, I think some just missed communication and, and myth busting that needed to be done um, around the cost of that to their um, condo tenants, um, you know, where they're going to be major energy upgrades required that then was going to lead to huge assessment um, fees. Um, and so there was a lot of um, talk about like property value and what if my building's performing terribly and does that affect my property value? And we just had to talk through a lot of those things with um, residential um, property managers and, and also talk about what they could do and, and what an asset it could make if they made those improvements that would lower all of their bills, um, lower their efficiency. We've actually seen some multifamily buildings set up their portfolio manager account, um, which I think is interesting, um, with their whole building data, um, but then also setting up their um, co corridor and common spaces as a separate meter so that they can see the improvements they're making to, their, to the investment to their portion of the building that they manage and can see that saving um, as opposed to the whole building, which may include the tenant spaces that they can't impact quite as much. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of education outreach. We've held over 45 free public trainings over the past three years, and I was at all of them, um, and hearing all of the, the comments and feedback. Um, and I think it's really about having that good support strategy in place um, um, to move it forward. <clears throat> Great, thank you. And we have a question for uh, anybody on the panel, um, any of the RIOs. Uh, in the course of putting together the uh, national assessment and uh, collecting information on the case studies around the country, what sort of financing developments have you seen uh, that are going on? Um, I, I can kick that off real quick, and then if anybody else has any uh, things they would like to add, um, please go ahead. Uh, one, one of the things that I mean, certainly commercial PACE, uh, to the extent that multifamily projects can be financed under commercial PACE, uh, we've seen um, strong interest, of course, in commercial PACE across the country. I can bring up um, the state of Texas as an example. Um, within the last two years, commercial PACE has gotten off the ground here. Um, I'm hearing that there are you know, several, you know, close to $100 million worth of projects in the queue. Um, one of the good things about the program and the way it was designed here is that it uses all private sector lenders and it's also standardized at the state level. So if counties or uh, municipalities implement commercial pace for uh, multifamily retrofits, it follows a standardized uh, state guideline um, which uses uh, some of the MNV data that EDF and a couple of other organizations uh, developed. Um, so we're optimistic, at least in Texas, that commercial pace will, will, will be a market maker and a market mover um, for commercial buildings for efficiency and, and on-site renewables, and hopefully especially for multifamily. I know that there's a couple, at least a couple of projects in the queue. Um, something that Charlie and I ran into as well, or actually I should say we all ran into when we were doing uh, some of the research on current financing mechanisms. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac both have programs for multifamily uh, projects. Uh, of interest is the green, uh, Fannie Mae Green Finance Program. They call it their Green Rewards Program. And essentially, they will finance improvements of at least 20% that show that can show at least 20% usage savings of water or electricity. What was interesting about that program is that you know they're buying down the interest rate 
and so it's got a it's got an incentive rate it's got a an incentive around the interest rate, uh, but it also includes reimbursement at closing for the ASHRAE level two audit that's required, and that's that's a, a loan program that again uses private sector lenders. So a lot of these multifamily companies are familiar with those lenders are already doing business with them, and they can acquire a property or refinance it and inc and include those energy efficiency measures. And uh, I think they told us that they had um, a significant amount of projects in the queue as well, $1.6 1, I think, if I remember my, my numbers correctly. So a couple, of, a couple of interesting developments on the financial front. I don't know if any of the other, anybody else on the panel or the Rios would like to add anything on financing. Uh, we've got three or four more minutes of time, it looks like. Eric, I'll jump in. This is Julia from the Midwest Energy Efficiency Alliance. Um, so we have seen, like Eric was saying, we've definitely seen an interest in commercial pace for multifamily uh, buildings in the Midwest. And some of the PACE programs um, have completed uh, and closed on multifamily projects. Uh, what we've also seen is um, an interest in on-bill financing. And in Illinois, there is a successful on-bill program that required some tailoring, but is made available to the multifamily sector. Um, and probably the biggest lesson learned there is um, most of the multifamily projects are, I think all of them actually, are market rate affordable. Um, and the original contractor uh, for the on-bill program um, was having trouble reaching the multifamily sector, so they actually subcontracted to a local community development financial institution um, who has experience lending to uh, market rate affordable buildings, um, understanding the sort of financial situations of those buildings and you know what metrics to look at um, in order to lend to them um, while still ensuring, of course, that the savings uh, is greater than the um, amount of loan repayment on your bill. So that's something um, that we've, we're have we pretty proud of in Chicago and the Midwest. Um, and then the one other thing is it is included as a case study in the report, the Michigan Saves Program. Um, that is a program, it's a loan program that was um, originally designed not for the multifamily sector, then they rolled out a multifamily sector component. And um, in order to really get traction and uptake with that program, they bought down, you know, it was designed as a low interest loan program to begin with, but they bought down the interest rate to zero um, by partnering with uh, utility incentives um, and ratepayer money. So the rate to be, and that's where they saw once they got the interest rate down to zero, they saw um, a significant uptick in participation um, and projects coming in. The, I think the one hang up that we learned about was that if the utilities stop offering the incentives, obviously they can no longer offer uh, a zero percent interest rate. Um, but yeah, we've seen some great innovation in the Midwest. I think we're, I think, Charlie, I'm going to hand it back over to you. I think we're closing out on time, right? Yeah, I think we are just about out of time. So thanks, everybody, for joining us and for your great questions. Um, and we would encourage you to, to download the report, um, take a look at it, send us any, any feedback or ideas you have. Um, and we welcome um, the opportunity to collaborate with you all to advance the energy efficiency of the multifamily sector. So um, have a great day, and thanks again for joining us.